where in this one version or another of this graph has been shown already. Here is what you get since 1975 from the tropospheric temperature changes. Here are all the IPCC models. They not only differ hugely from each other, admittedly over a small range, but they all practically are out of the range of the observations. Uh, at this meeting, but also a lot of other people I mean, have made the point that with this spaghetti here, the model ensemble, to use the average of the model ensemble as the IPCC does is absurd. If you were an engineer and you were confronted by this, you know, even if you didn't understand the situation, you'd say, you know, a few models are at least in range. How do they differ from all the other models? Let's throw away the other models and find out why they did so much worse. Instead, in the democratic processes of the UN, all models are equal. Um, you know, the reason I say you can't get sensitivity per se out of it is you have the fudge factors, and so you can always argue, however implausibly, that it's possible you have high sensitivity. <coughs> you have to understand that in the normal world, for instance, uh, with tobacco and lung cancer, all the studies had problems. What was leading to the conclusion that you were causing lung cancer was a meta-analysis combining all the studies and saying if they're all pointing in the same direction, one probably should give more statistical confidence to the result even if the individual studies had problems. This is the situation one's in with the temperature changes itself. Normally they tell you your, direction, your problems are all in one direction. It probably suggests lower sensitivity. Now, there are other ways of looking at it, uh, sensitivity. I'll go through a few of them. We mentioned uh, time scale. Uh, Gerard Rowe, in 2009, made a very simple point that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation has an index, um, really, this is a story, you know, almost all the oceanographers like, but, uh, you know, that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is not decadal, it's not an oscillation, but at least it's in the Pacific. <laughs> it, be it behaves as a first-order Markov process with a certain response time. The interesting thing is the, the response time is about 1.6 years. And that would give you series that look like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. There's a simple thing you can do, which the IPCC has this CMIP program at Lawrence Livermore. So you have all the model results. You can look at North Pacific temperatures, for instance, and ask, if you try to model them with an autoregressive process, what is the response time you get from the model versus what you get for the data? And um, this is just why you can use temperature instead. But what you got for the models was almost all the models that had enough to do this were getting somewhere on the order of 25, 28 months and the response time in the data is typically around the order of 10 to 15. Again, it suggests model sensitivity is excessive. It's not convincing. Obvious approach is to try and measure the feedbacks, and I've done this with a colleague, Young Sung Choi, uh, which is to use satellites to look at the outgoing long wave radiation and compare that with what the models give you for the same sea surface temperature. 
It's a technical issue, and I won't spend a lot of time. I promised Wolfgang that I would not continue indefinitely. But let me just, it's available for you who want to. But the thing about it is it leads to looking at long wave and short wave outgoing radiation regressed on intervals of temperature change. What one finds is for the long wave, there is a very clear feedback response that is negative. For the short wave, you have this S-shaped curve, which we now realize is largely a function of a very high noise to signal ratio. This is rather important, though, in its own right. Uh, it's saying that the long wave feedback is unambiguous. And this has been confirmed even by people like Trenberth and others who've looked at it. Now, what this means, and this is rather important, the water vapor feedback is a long wave feedback. You cannot, and I think I have a slide on that. Yeah, probably not. You can't separate the water vapor feedback from the cloud feedback at upper levels because the water vapor only affects the region not covered by the upper level clouds, but that's variable. So the only thing you have is the long wave feedback. Remember the reason you got the big range in sensitivity was you had 0.5 for the water vapor feedback. This is saying that even if it existed, it is canceled and exceeded by the cloud feedback or something else. So now when you come to that 1 over 1 minus f, you don't have the 0.5 to start with. You have 0. To get it to go from 2 to 5, you needed to have uh, 0.3 for the positive feedback. But if you start with zero, 0.3 does nothing. You're in the flat range of that curve. So you're insensitive. So this already, if it's true, is telling you you're not sensitive. OK. Um, this is just saying that. What about extreme weather? I'll just do that briefly. But this is one of the crazier things. Extreme weather is pure propaganda. The IPCC itself acknowledges no relation. That's important to understand. They have said that. I keep insisting, when you're attacking the IPCC, it's all well and good. But check what's inside it. What's inside it is often something that would argue against the hysteria. And given that it's in the IPCC, you can use it to your advantage. In the extra tropics, outside the tropics, what forces weather disturbances and variants is the difference in temperature between the equator and pole. All models of warming say that goes down, not up, in a warmer world which would suggest you have less potential for storms and less variance. It doesn't matter that that's the case. It's not scary, so you say the opposite. Uh, you also have to have a perspective. This is March 12, 2013. doesn't matter. I could pick any month. This is in the Boston Globe, our local newspaper. Uh, every day, it shows you the high and low temperature, the dark blue, for the preceding 30 days or so. It also shows the average high and low. That's the gray in here. And it also shows you the difference between the record-breaking high and the record-breaking low for each day, although those often occur many years ago. There is also a line here, a red line. And what that red line is, is simply the width of that line is the total range of global mean temperature anomaly for the last 150 years. 
Keep that in perspective when you discuss climate change in terms of that variable. Uh, the variance, and I, I've given this to high school students, it's kind of funny. The paper also publishes a map of the temperature for North America for the day. And uh, the exercise I ask the students to do is to estimate from this map what the record-breaking high and low was for the day, no matter what year it came from. And they always get it within a few degrees. It's the highest and lowest temperature on this map. One is advecting air from someplace else. It's not coming from changes in the radiation. 